It is an airport as remarkable for its architecture as it is for its place in world history. This broad-shouldered expanse of hangars, terminals, and ramps is unlike any in the world. Indeed, it is so massive a structure that a pilot can taxi an airplane directly under the shelter of its roof and unload passengers or cargo without regard to wind or weather. In 1948, this proved to be indispensable. That year, struggling to recover from the ravages of World War II, Berlin was totally and unexpectedly cut off by the Soviets. 70 miles from the nearest western border, anything and everything that Berlin needed had to come by air, and Tempelhof was the main airport. When you talk to eyewitnesses, the first thing they tell you is about the constant sound they heard in the air, that is, uh, the continuous movement of aeroplanes. And uh, they, especially the young kids, became so accustomed to it that even today, almost 50 years later, they still vividly remember this sound and they really got frightened when this sound stopped because it meant whenever that sound wasn't there, something happened, seriously happened and it uh, threatened their livelihood because um, you know, food was coming in and without that sound, the food didn't come in. The roar of aircraft engines became the signature for the world's most important uses of aviation. The Berlin Airlift. 2.3 million tons of supplies would be delivered in a remarkable story of transportation logistics carried out day and night, good weather and bad, for 277,000 flights. War II in Europe ended with wave upon wave of Allied bombers carpet bombing just one city, Berlin, capital of Hitler's Nazi Germany. The pounding went on day and night. The devastation was vast and complete. Berlin was pulverized. And then it was over. Cold War expert and scholar Helmut Krotnow PhD, Cambridge educated, director of the Allied Museum in Berlin, explains. Indeed, it was completely wrecked. There are several uh, accounts of eyewitnesses. For example, the um, um, Air Marshal Tedder, who took part in the um, surrender ceremony of uh, the German um, uh, Army Wehrmacht in Karlshorst in, in, on, on the 8th of May 45. When he looked down, uh, approaching Berlin, you know, looked down from the plane, he said, there is not going to be any life in the future in this place. Um, it was indeed completely wrecked. You had uh, no house intact anymore. It was just the facades of buildings, uh, no water supply, sanitation didn't exist anymore. Um, you had uh, corpses, corpses of animals all over the place. You had no food, no communication, nothing. It was all completely run down. And one shall not forget that um, after Berlin had surrendered to the Russians uh, in April, the Soviet army really ransacked the place after the war. And um, again, telling from accounts we have uh, from the Western side, uh, what they left behind, at least in the Western sectors, was terrible enough. 
Um, you know, there was nothing, literally speaking, nothing intact anymore. But how do you end a war? In this case, poorly, as it turned out. Occupation forces partitioned Germany into four sectors, each governed by one of the four allies, Britain, France, America, and the Soviet Union. Worse, deep in the Soviet sector lay Berlin, herself divided four times again. Therein lay the seeds for confrontation and the root of what was to become the Berlin blockade. Diplomacy was playing second fiddle to a bewildering array of chefs in the kitchen, three Western allies and the Russians. Well, it begin, began really shortly after the war, the end of the war in 45, when the Soviet Union decided that um, they didn't really want to share the authority in Berlin and in that part of Germany with the Western allies. Uh, one of the major uh, concern uh, of the Western allies was to get, you know, life going, the society going again, rebuilding, restoring, getting rid of the ruins and clearing up uh, the city. Therefore, they needed uh, an economic organization and that led to um, deciding, well, we have to combine the, the zones and that needed also a new currency. And uh, the Soviet Union didn't like the unifying effects uh, the Western policy had. And so, a blockade of Berlin began. Oddly enough, a legal blockade. Early on, somewhat fearful that any legal document would actually limit America's rights, General Lucius Clay, then military governor of the American zone, decided not to press the Soviets or written confirmation that Americans would have unlimited access to Berlin via the highways, rail, and rivers into the city. When the blockade began, the Soviets actually stood on firm legal ground. There was no written agreement that prevented their action. There was, however, a written agreement guaranteeing access by air. In an air safety document dating back to November 1945, signed by the Soviets, three 20-mile-wide air corridors had been designated as free airspace for British, French, and American airplanes, so long as they flew below an altitude of 10,000 feet. The Soviets never thought that anyone would consider feeding a city of two million by air. The Americans thought otherwise. Well, they reacted very swiftly. Um, you see the first signs of blockage, blockade, um, appeared as early as uh, March, April, uh, February, uh, 48. And um, uh, Clay, the um, um, military command and, and head of the military government, decided, well, I bring in um, planes with, um, you know, food, um, just as a sort of, as a sign or token to the other side, look, you know, we take it seriously and we're able to react. If we don't, uh, we're not allowed to get access on the ground, then we use the air. But if the airlift were to break the blockade, and thus the Soviets will, Berlin would have to have everything brought in by air. Inside the city, little was actually produced in the way of essentials. And what little industry had been rebuilt was helpless without power. It too was cut off by the Soviets. You see, Berlin had always been supplied with energy from the area surround, not only the, um, the food, but uh, from electricity to heating, everything. And uh, when the blockade uh, started, the Russians um, put off everything that is from electricity to um, um, heating. And so, with almost no warning, no pre-planning, a massive airlift began, one that had to deliver a minimum of 4,500 tons of coal, medicine, and food every day. The first transport to fly the airlift 
was the venerable DC-3, called the C-47 by the Air Force. This C-47 actually flew the airlift, and so it is with more than a sense of duty that she is being lovingly restored here in one of the same hangars that protected her during the brutally harsh winter of 1948. The nose art was apropos of the airlift, EATS, although, in fact, it stood for European Air Transport Service, an arm of the military air transport service that donated many aircraft to the airlift. A look inside her hull, however, points up the logistics problem the airlift immediately faced. The C-47 had a maximum capacity of just three tons, which was good for her day, but not much for a city of two million. To help cram the most cargo inside her, all of the foods delivered to Berlin were dehydrated. Even so, three tons was not a lot when the job called for thousands a day. One hundred two C-47s were flying the airlift when it began in July 1948. Six months later, there were none. America had a bigger transport, the Douglas C-54. carried three times the payload of a C-47, 10 tons. And by January 1949, 249 were flying the airlift. This is the C-54, four round engines, tricycle landing gear, swept tails. The C-54 would enter passenger service in America as the DC-4 and would be one of the most popular airliners of the prop era. For now, however, she represented just one thing, more capacity per flight in and out of Berlin. This C-54 is adorned with special nose art. The Berliners dubbed the giant transports the Raisin Bombers or Rosinen Bombers. The Berliners always um, playing around with language and um, you know having irony on, on their side, sort of speaking with cheek and tongue, had to create a nickname for these planes that brought in food. The expression was part sarcasm and part appreciative humor. After enduring the raids of World War II, new aircraft were now flying Berlin skies. But instead of big bombs, they carried food, raisins among them. And what better contrast with a 500-pound bomb than five grams of raisins? While the C-47s and C-54s ran their round-robin routes in and out of Berlin, other aircraft worked in the background. The first was the C-82, the flying boxcar. Its novel twin-boom construction was designed around a boxy cargo bay accessed on the ground by a convenient drive-up ramp. C-82s brought in industrial equipment and would play a key role later in the airlift supplying construction equipment to the airlift. The C-74 Globemaster was introduced into the Air Force in 1948, but only a squadron was flying by the time of the airlift. Nonetheless, they ran the supply tail of the operation, ferrying spare engines back and forth between the United States and England. The one day C-74s flew the airlift corridors, they completed four trips each with 25 tons of supplies. As General William H. Tunner, commander of operations for the Berlin Airlift said, the real excitement of running a successful airlift comes from seeing a dozen lines climbing steadily, such as tonnage delivered and aircraft utilization rates, while watching two decline, accidents and maintenance downtime. 
The military doctrine of airlift actually goes back to the days of flying supplies over the hump during World War II. Pilots there learned that the secret to a successful operation was to find as many aircraft as possible, get them into the air, and keep them flying. Once the airspace was saturated with flights, doctrine called for the systematic replacement of smaller aircraft with larger ones, until large capacity aircraft were flying saturation level cycles in and out, and in and out. We always have to remember it was not only flying, but it involved a lot of technical aspects. And without the development on the technical side, the airlift certainly could not have been a success. Um, the logistics, you know, just um, the idea of um, having that many planes at the same time, all in a condensed airspace, was an, a, you know, quite an achievement. And that was one of the reasons why the Americans, when it became clear that the blockade was going to last longer than a couple of months, uh, brought in General Tunner because he had the experience of the airlift during uh, the Second World War into China. And uh, the experience um, uh, he made there of uh, you know, how to um, develop a logistics of getting it organized certainly helped him improve on you know, the situation that was uh, in Berlin and all the various other stations you had in West Germany. To understand the airlift, you have to digest it in parts. First of all, Berlin needed a minimum of 4,500 tons of supplies a day, and it could use more. Nonetheless, by air, 4,500 tons is a considerable feat, and not always in obvious ways. For instance, with a C-54, it would take 450 landings a day to deliver the city's tonnage which, divided into a 24-hour day, meant one arrival every three minutes. But the transports had to get out, too. So between each landing, there had to be one takeoff. Thus, the rhythm for the airlift called for a minimum of one takeoff or landing every 90 seconds, day and night, which, as General Tunner noted, left little time wasted on the ends of the runway. The logistics of Operation Vittles, as the Berlin Airlift was called, were broken down into four categories, airports, flight operations, ground operations, and maintenance. Airports were understandably the first concern. In a small passenger plane, a takeoff and landing every 90 seconds was one thing. In a 10-ton cargo transport, it was quite another. Did Berlin have airports to handle such brutal traffic? And could the runways take the pounding? As it happened, Berlin had two airports, Gatow in the British sector and Tempelhof in the American. Gatow would be used to the maximum by the British, while Tempelhof would be saturated by the Americans. Tunner's approach to the airlift was to build a conveyor belt in the sky. To make it work, the receiving airport had to have plenty of room, and Tempelhof had it in spades. Its classic concave design provided an enormous ramp area for aircraft and for cargo offloading. A dozen C-47s or C-54s could fit in at the same time without interfering with each other. Then there were the cavernous Tempelhof hangars, giant steel trusses thrust out over the tarmac and covered massive interior spaces. Huge hangar doors moved back and forth on steel tracks, opening or closing depending on the weather. This C-47 is dwarfed inside one such hangar, and often there were several inside together. Tempelhof, though, was surrounded by the city, and the final approach to the runway was dangerous. 
high-rise apartment buildings are clearly visible on either side of the arriving aircraft. And while easily avoided during the day, at night or in bad weather, the fit was tight indeed. British operation from Gatow followed the logistics plan set by the Americans, except in one respect. Never ones to pass on opportunity, the British made good use of Berlin's lakes. These magnificent Sunderlands thundered right into the heart of Berlin and offloaded their cargo to waiting boats. It made for a spectacular sight. When the, the British side brought in water planes uh, landing on the harbor and then starting there, uh, which became a, a big event for the Berlin families over the weekends. You know, they always rushed down to the harbor and watched uh, the, the planes coming in and uh, going out again. Uh, they were the only planes that could uh, transport salt uh, because all the others would have um, had erosion coming in. In truth, lakes had one advantage that conventional airports lacked. They never needed repairs. Tempelhof was built in 1933 and used as an assembly plant for Luftwaffe fighters. It was never designed for high cycle operations. In short order, the 10 ton transports ripped her runways to shreds. In addition to throwing down reinforced steel mats, General Tunner sent repair gangs out to the edge of the runway, always ready to dash in between arriving aircraft and throw asphalt down when a pothole appeared. It was chaotic, but it worked. The real solution to the wear and tear was to build another airport. Scouring the western sectors for a suitable site, a promising area in the French sector was found. It would be known as Tegel, a good patch of high land with unobstructed approaches. Construction began in July of 48, and the first Vittles flight landed in November. Incredibly, despite the blockade, an entire airport was built in just 90 days, using thousands of Berliners as laborers. Crushed brick from the city's war debris provided the runway's base. Heavy construction equipment was brought in by the C-82s. Safety and dense traffic are uncomfortable bedfellows, but they had to coexist over Berlin. When the airlift started on June 28, pilots were practically on their own. Just as soon as an air crew or an aircraft arrived, they were flying the corridors. The briefing was simple. You're a pilot, fly your aircraft. But that wasn't good enough. Airplanes started to stack over Berlin aerial near misses were too frequent, and precise air traffic control was a myth. With round trips of four hours, the potential for disaster was ever present. Tunner instituted improvements in flight operations immediately. Scheduling would become the mantra. Precise departures, precise en route airspeeds, and precise new air traffic control called Ground Control Approach Radar on arrival. Baker George II, uh, this is the final controller. Uh, remain on receive for the remainder of this transmission. Uh, maintain your present elevation and continue vector 315. You're almost at the glide path. Uh, begin your rate of descent at 500 feet per minute. We're starting down the glide path. A rate of descent is good. Azimuth is good. Elevation good. Very nice flying indeed. Maintain your heading. On course. On the glide path. Very good. Now over the end of the runway. Azimuth and elevation both perfect. Touchdown in four seconds. Take it over, Baker George. It's all yours from here. The secret to air safety was to adapt familiar in-flight rules to the high-density traffic of Berlin. 
aircraft have traditionally been separated by flying at assigned altitudes. To make the airlift work, the corridors were simply divided into three assigned altitudes, with departures into the corridors spaced three minutes apart. The corridors themselves were regulated. All inbound American traffic used the southern corridor and flew not only at the assigned altitude and airspeed, but with arrival and departure intervals over location markers precisely timed. The new radars tracked each aircraft and called speed adjustments down to a single knot, 170 knots in, 185 knots out. Pilots would hear about it if they crept forward or fell back in the sky as much as a few feet. When the weather fell below the minimums and the pilot missed the approach to the airfield, the aircraft was sent home via the middle corridor. The middle corridor was reserved exclusively for returning flights. Weather forecasting was standardized too. 570 weather personnel were assigned to the airlift. With one landing every three minutes, it was not enough to take meteorological readings once or twice a day. For a while, every seventh C-54 made four standardized weather reports at four points in the corridor. Later, B-17 weather ships would fly above the transports and broadcast readings back to base operations. Nonetheless, all pilots were briefed before departures and all flights were on instruments. In turn, air traffic controllers tracked the traffic. 790 officers and airmen manned the towers before the airlift was over. Ground operations were the airlift's Achilles heel. At first, labor of course was plentiful and men were readily available to heave sacks of flour and coal on and off the planes. But it was the absence of any organized process to the unloading that made it time consuming. Rhythm, as Tunner would say. A steady rhythm is key to an airlift. Brute strength alone is not enough. And so Tunner brought in motion study experts to evaluate their operations. With stopwatches, they found ways for a crew of 12 men to unload a C-54 in six minutes. Refueling was reduced from 33 minutes to eight. After it was all said and done, turnaround times were chopped from 60 minutes to 30. Ironically, with the increase in tempo, morale actually improved, perhaps all in all because of the carts. Tunner noticed that the men tended to drift off between planes and he was losing time gathering them up again. To keep them roped in, he instituted food carts with coffee, hot dogs, and pretty girls. The airlift, however, pointed up one deficiency that was never remedied during the blockade. There was no equipment specifically designed for loading cargo planes. Except for the hump, transporting cargo by air was generally unheard of. Berlin changed that, and purpose-built cargo handling equipment was soon added by the Air Force. Tunner dreamed of having an airplane land once a minute for each of the 1,440 minutes in a day. That he even came close to that goal was a tribute to standardized maintenance. On Easter Day 1949, he actually got 1,398 landings and delivered 12,941 tons. Like all things mechanical, aircraft actually do better when they're flown. 
but the wear and tear of the high cycle operations wore parts down and maintenance had to closely follow the status of each and every aircraft. A standardized plan was instituted by Tunner. Crews performed as needed maintenance at 25 hours. At 200 hours, the plane went to a depot for major inspection. And at 1,000 hours, it flew to Oklahoma City for a complete overhaul. The 200-hour check was called production line maintenance. A C-54 would be towed down a line and serviced as it moved. Seven planes could complete the cycle in a day. At the heart of it all, the workaday world of an airlift was flying and loading and sleeping and repeating it all over again. It was a dull business, Tunner was fond of saying, a steady rhythm, constant, no frenzy or flat. You don't see airplanes parked all over the place. They're either in the air, loading, unloading, or being worked on. You not only had to have the planes and the pilots, but you also had to have the people in the, in the towers. And, uh, and, of course, you had to make sure that once the planes were on the ground, the ground they had to be unpacked uh, you know, in, in, um, in no time. And um, yes, but at the, sort of at the height of the airlift, it became a kind of competition among the various stations who could uh, you know, uh, produce um, the highest numbers. And that was the nature of the airlift, flying and flying and flying. 92 million air miles flown on a 200-mile circuit. From what I understand, going through a lot of memoirs of pilots during the airlift, it must have been a very bo boring but also uh, strenuous experience, you know, being constantly in the air, not having any kind of, of uh, spare time, but continuously flying in very dire circumstances. And, you know, you had to keep awake. Um, you know, you didn't sleep in the best of, um, you know, environments um, and you were constantly on alert. Not unexpectedly, airlift flights were harassed by the Soviets. Official records document 733 incidents of buzzing, flak, air-to-air -air fire, blinding searchlights and balloons launched in the way of the pilots. But for a show of force, there may have been more. U.S. fighter pilots and B-29s made well-timed appearances in Berlin. The message to the Soviets was clear. Oh yes, um, you know, I can, I can tell you my generation um, grew up with a saying, you know, look up in the air and if you see an aeroplane, you might get a candy. Although I'd never, you know, lived in Berlin at the time. Um, and um, the reason for this well-known saying um, uh, was uh, the airlift and especially somebody called Gail Halverson, an American pilot. It was hard to ignore the children of Berlin and Lieutenant Gail Halverson started an airlift of his own. It came to be known as Little Vittles and consisted of candy bars tied into handkerchiefs and dropped to the children waiting below the flight path. Little Vittles spawned collection sites in America and was a morale builder among the air crews. The airlift was uh, technically called Operation Vittles on the American side and um, the American, I don't know, whether it was the administration or the, the, the public called it Little Vittles operation. And um, it really um, grew to enormous proportions that um, 
not only you know Gail Helverson um, pushed out uh, candies and, and things, but uh, practically every other uh, pilot coming in, and um, obviously that enjoyed um, the young Berliners very much. I can imagine seeing these, um, you know, glowing, laughing, enjoying faces of young kids uh, must have been quite, um, you know, an experience. And on the other hand, you know, they didn't have much of an opportunity of uh, moving outside um, the airfields um, because, um, you know, the, the period um, of the plane being stationed was very short. So they had to be kept um, at the airports, but these kids were sort of lining the, uh, you know, the flight path coming down. And um, you know, they, they must have seen hundreds, thousands of these kids waiting for them. The airlift was um, a big achievement, but um, it wasn't free of cost. And um, the, um, the saddest cost was, of course, life. 72 or 71 pilots and engineers um, and um, other technical um, staff um, was killed uh, during the airlift uh, because of accidents. Um, Looking back, uh, it's amazing that uh, there weren't more fat fatalities. You know, that was a price we, we had to pay, but uh, especially the Western Allies. This is the dedication of the Tempelhof Memorial, built to honor the men and women of the airlift. A tribute to the airmen, one wreath is placed at its base for each life lost. Today, Tempelhof stands proud, a monument to the joy of freedom that united four nations against Soviet domination. Around its base are inscribed the names of those that died during the greatest airlift in the world.
When pilots gather and talk about the Berlin Airlift, they talk about the children. Rarely has aviation served such high purpose. Rarely has the satisfactions of hard work been so completely rewarded. But such was the case in 1948, 15 months that kept the city free. This is, for example, a, has been a, a major impact on the relationship between Germans on the one hand, you know, the vanquished Germans, and the victorious Western powers, because they had to cooperate with each other. The Germans realized that uh, the Western powers meant business when they talked about rebuilding Germany. So all of a sudden, they were in the same boat. And the success of their cooperation kept Berlin alive. And this was one of the, uh, you know, one of the reasons why this special relationship um, with America, Britain and France developed in Berlin. Here's the cradle of that friendship. And this is uh, because of the airlift. <laughs> 